Well, good morning. <clears throat> if you brought your Bibles, get them out, turn them on if they're electronic, and head on over to Exodus chapter 19. We're going to be good Bereans today. We're going to study the Word of God and see what it has to say for you and for me. Um, and I want to thank Pastor John for preaching last week on Ephesians 4, and um, I got the opportunity to go preach at uh, Plum Creek Chapel in Sedalia, Colorado. Uh, so we as a, a young church plant, we're, our church is about three and a half, almost four years old. Um, when we started, we asked a bunch of other churches in our fellowship to help support us. And, and uh, Plum Creek Chapel is one of those churches that financially supports us as Freedom Church. Uh, so I got the opportunity to go talk with them. They, they got a new pastor a year or two ago and, and a lot of new people in the church. So I introduced Freedom Church to, uh, to them up in, uh, up in Sedalia. Uh, and uh, I will tell you, I missed seeing your guys' faces, though. It's fun to preach at churches, but I love preaching and teaching you guys and seeing you and, and, uh, and whatnot. So thanks for being here today. Um, every day, you and I, we get in a car, and we drive to work, we drive to church, to school, uh, to the store, uh, and anywhere else. And, and if you've been a driver for very long... Um, you just kind of follow the rules of the road without even paying much attention, right? Like, I don't know how many times I've, I've made the drive between my house and here, and I don't remember the drive, right? I remember one time I, I had to drive down to Albuquerque, uh, and I got on, on the interstate, and uh, it felt like maybe 10 minutes, uh, and it was a six-hour drive. So I was just praying and talking to God, and, and you just kind of showed up. And it was scary, you know, um, I was not under the influence of anything other than water, so that wasn't that, you know. But uh, we respond to these rules of the road almost instinctively, right? We drive on the correct side of the road. We hit the brakes when we see a stop sign or a yellow or red light, and some of us are better than that than others. We're careful to go the right way on a one-way street. We merge when the sign tells us to merge. Uh, once again, some people are better at that than others. Um, and on a, a relatively short trip, someone driving a car will make hundreds of decisions based on the signs of the road and the rules that they represent. Following these simple driving instructions, it's not a recipe for ruining our trip, is it? Or for sucking the joy out of the open road. But these rules are a way to make sure that we stay alive, to make sure that we don't hurt someone else. So they protect us, they direct us, they keep us safe. And without them, without the rules of the road, a one-mile drive across town would be a pretty dangerous drive, wouldn't it? Um, it'd be chaotic, it'd be potentially life-threatening. Um, if you ever get a chance, I think some of the best and worst drivers are in India. Uh, they are, are very good at knowing where the corners of their vehicles are, but it's pretty crazy. So I found this video. Uh, I don't know if this is in India or not, but this is a, a, an interesting intersection I wanted to show you guys, and let's hope that it works. It's in Ethiopia. Okay. Look at this. Does it look like there's any rules here? I, I have yet... I, I mean, they're kind of driving on the right side of the road. Um, how long do you think an intersection like this would exist in the United States? Like seconds, right? And then there'd be, and, and this goes on for minutes, so we're not going to watch all of it, but there's no accidents. There's pedestrians, there's bicycles, there's motorcycles, buses, everything. Um, I think the, I, the only rule that I can get is the bigger you are, the fewer rules you have. That's it. All right, you can shut that off. That's a pretty crazy road trip, right? And, and I counted this morning um, between uh, Powers and Galley, when I turn onto that, there are over 25 signs between there, up over the hill, and here. And most of that is residential. Uh, and so there's lots of places other than the road where you've got rules. In the military, we've got what we call ROEs, the Rules of Engagement. Uh, you have an employee manual where you work that outlines the rules. There's dinner party rules. Um, there's rules everywhere you go. And there's a, a story of this little five-year-old girl that was having trouble uh, all day long with her mom. She was arguing back and forth. And I know, kids, you're perfect. You never argue with your parents, right? 
Never happened. So this, this isn't anybody in, in our church. But the mom, she got so tired of this. She finally yelled at the little girl, I want you to sit in the corner right now and don't get up until I tell you to. Any parents ever said that? Go sit in the corner. Go count bricks. That was my, my parents' thing. Go count bricks. There are 484 on the west wall of my parents' home, just so you know. Go count bricks and don't get up until I tell you to. So the little girl went over to the corner. She sat down for a few minutes and she thought about it. And then she yelled to her mom, Mom, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> right? And every one of us has that little girl in our hearts, right? Where we're standing up on the inside nature when it comes to rules. We don't like being told what to do. We don't like authority in our lives. And I think that's one of the reasons why our culture, our society, has such a problem with the Ten Commandments. I mean, let's be honest. The Ten Commandments, they're, they're awesome, and they're not really that bad. Even if you're not a follower of Christ, I mean, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't covet, don't murder. Th those should be kind of general rules in any society. Yet, our culture is opposed to them because these rules came from God. So just a reminder, as we're going through the story, we've got the upper story and the lower story. Uh, the lower story is kind of our day-to-day, -day, uh, how we work and, and where, where we operate and things like that. And then we've got God's upper story. And one of the main themes of God's upper story is God's passion to be with his people. And last uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the true story of the 10 plagues, how God used them to show us his name, his power, and his plan and he brought the Israelites out of Egypt, and they began their journey home to the promised land. So that's where we ended the story last week. So let's look at Exodus chapter 19, starting in verse 1. It says this, Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking camp, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carry you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me and keep my commands, covenant, you will be my special treasure from among all the peoples on earth, for all the earth belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So Moses returned from the mountain, called together the elders of the people, told them everything the Lord had commanded them. And all the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. So what we have here is we have the God, the creator God of the universe is starting to set aside the nation of Israel as a people unto himself. And in order for these people that are living in their sin, in order for them to stand before and to represent a holy God, they have to be made right with God. They have to be righteous. They have to be holy. And in order for God to live with his people, there's three details that must be worked out. And these are the three details we're going to go in depth in today. But first of all, we see that God provides guidelines on how to relate to him and other people. These are the Ten Commandments. So turn to Exodus chapter 20. Because you see God in creating this community, he wants this community of love that reflects the relationship that he has within himself. Have you guys ever heard of the word Trinity to describe the Godhead? It's, it's one God, but there's three persons. Um, and it's one of the great mysteries of the faith. But you've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They've eternally existed, and they've eternally existed within community. And so God wants a community to kind of represent that. So look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Then God gave the people these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read a list of rules, one of my first questions is, who gives you the authority to tell me what to do, right? That's that part within me, like, I don't have to listen to you. So we should ask the question, what gives God the authority to lay out these instructions, to lay out these commands to his people? 
First of all, it's he's God. That's a pretty good reason, right? God says do this. God says don't do that. We should probably do this and not do that. Um, Because there's one person in the entire universe you don't want to make mad. It's God. There's one person that you want to please and bring a smile to their face. It's, It's God. That's why when we look at the Word of God, and sometimes the Word of God says something that we don't like, guess who's wrong? We are, because this is the word of God. It's always right, never wrong. Amen. Amen? So he's God, first of all, and then he delivered them out of Egypt. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about laws and rules and all of that, but I want you to see the grace that's dripping out of verse two. I am the Lord, your God. And what did this God do? He rescued them from the land of Egypt, from their slavery. That's grace. So lest we think that the Old Testament is just a bunch of a list of things to do and not do, it comes from God's heart of grace. He says, because I'm your God, because I rescued you, here are some things that are going to help you live your life. And so we should listen to these words. The Ten Commandments shape the community of God. And so as you read through the Old Testament, biblical scholars have found there are 613 commands. So we always focus on the Ten But if you take those 613 commands in Scripture, almost every single one of them falls into one of these 10 buckets, right? So the rest of of, of the law that's given in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all of the law that's given there can fit into one of these 10 commandments. And we're going to talk about what Jesus said about these commandments a little bit later. But commandments 1 through 4 guide how we treat God. So the, the first four commandments govern our vertical relationship. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. You must not have any other God but me. That's pretty clear, right? Who's number one? God. Who's number two? <laughs> Whoever's important in your life after that, right? I, I used to drive Lindsay nuts when we first got married because uh, I would use, always used to tell her, you're number two, you're number... I want to be number one. I'm like, God's number one. She's like, okay, well, let's... let's Assume God's number one. Now, who's number one after that? I'm like, okay, well, you can, be, you can be number one second place. What do they call that in beauty pageants? First runner-up or something like that? So there we go, first runner-up, right? But God is number one. Nothing else, no other gods, no sports, uh, no children, no spouses, no alcohol, no drugs, no pornography. Nothing is to be above God. God is number one, first and foremost. Commandment number two, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love on a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Commandment number one, no other God but me. Commandment number two, no idols. We're going to see how when Moses was up talking to God about these commandments, the people immediately broke commandments one and two. We're going to come back to those. So no other God but him. They lived in a very pagan culture. Uh, so this was monotheism. This was brand new. This was the way things were supposed to be. So, And then also no idols in people's lives. God's is supposed to have the number one place in our heart. Nothing is to usurp that. Then commandment number three, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. And this is, if you are out in public and you hear somebody say the Lord's name in vain, you have the authority of God to go up and ask him to stop. I had one rule when it came to language in my GED class, don't use the Lord's name in vain. And the kids came in, They had more colorful language than some of the sailors that I knew. I told them that one command and they were able to. So I was like, you can turn it on and turn it off. So let's just shut all of it off, right? But don't use the Lord's name in vain. And if you hear it, stand up for the Lord's name as well. Number eight, remember, or sorry, verse eight, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. 
You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Are you taking a Sabbath day? The Sabbath was made for you, right? To give you permission to stop, to reconnect with God, to reconnect with family. I, I had a pastor friend, and this joke's been going around Facebook, but I had someone actually say it to me. Uh, he said, I never take a day off because Satan doesn't take a day off. And you just say, maybe you should pick a different role model, right? Find someone else. <laughs> Jesus rested. Jesus took time off. God took a day off so we can rest. The Sabbath is an essentially instruction for us to take a day off from our lower story work and focus on our upper story relationship with God. That's why we talk about stewardship. So you have the first four commandments dealing with your vertical relationship with God. And then um, the fifth commandment I kind of see as a transitional one that has to do with God the Father, but it starts to shift us to our horizontal relationships. And this is honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land your God is giving you. So this is how we treat other people. Honor your father and mother. And then verse 13, you must not murder that's pretty straightforward, right? You must not commit adultery, another straightforward commandment. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. So we are not to covet what our neighbor has. And as we read through that, there's some things that were like, God, I wish that wasn't there, right? Like when I was a kid, I really wish honor your father and mother wasn't there. But now that I'm a dad, I'm so grateful that that commandment is in there. God said it, not me, right? And I've got great kids. But our sin nature rises within us and wants us to resist these guidelines, and God does not desire to be with rebellious people. The reason Satan was cast out of heaven was for his rebellion against God. His rebellion against God. And I, it's not in my notes, but one of the things I want to mention is when Jesus was, at, Jesus was asked a couple times about these commandments, um, and that commandment, you must not murder, right? I think... I shouldn't speak for everyone. I have not broken that commandment. You must not murder. But you know what Jesus says? If you harbor hate in your heart towards someone else, that's the equivalent of murder. Now I've broken that commandment. Jesus, the commandment says you shall not commit adultery. I've not committed adultery. Jesus says if you look upon a woman with lust, you've committed adultery. Crap. Right? So... Lest you think these are just kind of base commandments, Jesus takes them to another level, right? As Moses is receiving these commandments, because remember, he's up on Mount Sinai. He's up meeting with God, just him. As he's receiving God's instructions on the mountain, Israel, the, the million or two million people that, that, that were led out of Egypt, they get impatient. Anybody ever been in, impatient? No? Well, now you got a million people like, oh my gosh, Moses, come on, because he's up there for 40 days, right? Like, you should, you should be back by now. Um, I would like to think that if I saw Moses walk up on a mountain and then it was covered with a cloud and there was thunder and lightning, I'd probably wait longer than 40 days to see what was going on. But these people couldn't. They get impatient and they desi decide to create an idol of things that they deem of worth, gold and precious metals. Jump over to Exodus 32. So this is all happening. Exodus 32. When the people saw how, verse one, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take the gold rings 
from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears, brought them to Aaron. Aaron took the gold, melted it down, molded it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Really? You couldn't just wait a few more days? And that shows the gravitational force of sin, right? As a parent, how often have you said to your kids, what did I just tell you? What did I just say? You explain and review the rules over and over again, yet kids go out and disobey almost right away, don't they? I have on here, share a Scott story. I don't know if I'm ready to share. No, I'm just kidding. I was a pretty rebellious kid. I know that may come as a shock to some of you. Um, but if my parents told me to do something and I knew it was good for me, you know what I did? The exact opposite of what they asked me to do. So parents, if you've got kids like that, keep, keep praying, okay? Um, keep anointing them with oil as they sleep. Do whatever you got to do, right? And I imagine this is what God felt like when he told them, no other God but me, don't make any idols. And that's the first thing that they did. They disobeyed. The nature and effects of sin never change. Its gravitational force pulls us away from God. And if we're not careful, our sin nature will wreak havoc in our own lives and in the lives of those around us. That's why we constantly encourage people to practice the spiritual disciplines of confession and repentance, because we need to have a heart that's sensitive to, to what God is asking us to do. And so when we violate God's command or God's character or go against what he's asking us to do and, and the Holy Spirit convicts us, we need to immediately move to confession of sin, repentance, and restoration. Don't wait. Don't wait. So you think God was angry when this started to happen? Yeah. Do you, do you think it surprised God? Absolutely not. And Moses interceded so that God would not wipe out his rebellious people. Look at the end of Exodus 32, uh, verses 31 and 32. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, what a terrible sin these people have committed. They've made gods of gold for themselves. But now, if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, then erase my name from the record that you have written as well. So Moses interceded on behalf of, of the people and God relented and did not destroy them. So God provides guidelines on how to relate to him and other people. And we see those in the 10 commandments. In order for God to live with his people, there's another detail that must be worked out and that's God desires a place to dwell. This is where we get the story of the tabernacle in Exodus 25. So turn to Exodus 25. If you were part of our kids a few weeks ago, you should be able, Goober, Nella, you guys should be able to explain the tabernacle to everybody, what every little piece means. I'm not going to put you on the spot and have you come up here and do it, so don't worry about that. But we covered this a few weeks ago on Sunday night with the kiddos. But God gave specific directions for the making of the tabernacle. In Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9, it says this, Have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. You must build this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you. So God described this pattern, as the lampstand, the table, uh, the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the altar uh, for, burn, for burning, the, the daily offerings, the courtyard, uh, how the thing is supposed to, how the tabernacle is supposed to have lights, the clothing that the, the priests are supposed to wear. And he gets into to details because God's like, I'm a holy God, I need a place to dwell, and this place has to be perfect, so here's how it needs to be constructed. And, and there was, so there's the, you, the tabernacle was this big kind of square area, you'd walk in, there was a courtyard, um, and then there was a, a holy of holies, a most holy place that, that the, the presence of God would dwell. And he described how to build all of that. And there's a couple places around the, the world that have recreated this. There's a really neat one in, in Israel, and you can Google it and take a video tour of what it would like, look like. But the reason that God dwelled, His presence filled the Holy of Holies, was that no one 
could see God's face. And in this Holy of Holies, only the high priest could enter the most holy place once a year on behalf of the people. So this tabernacle was a portable tent uh, that the people would take down and put up any time that they would stop and go. And God guided his people as they wandered through the desert, which we're going to look at next week, through a moving cloud during the day and a column of fire by night. So God here gave his people his very presence. And that's pretty special, isn't it? I thought about to illustrate, because it says that, that his presence filled the tabernacle like smoke. I thought about bringing in a fog machine, but uh, I don't like fog machines in churches. So no fog machines. There will be, if we do trunk retreat, there will be a fog machine outside though, because I have a really cool Star Wars themed trunk, but neither here nor there. So God gave him the gift of his presence and he leads them and shows them the way that they are to go. And and throughout this, God, remember, always obeys his commands. So on the seventh day when he rested, we are to rest in God's presence. I'm going to read a couple verses to you. In Exodus 33, verse 14, it says this. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. God is going to give Moses. God is going to give the people rest. Jesus echoes this in Matthew 11. He says, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heaven burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart that you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. God desires a place to to dwell. Finally, we see that God requires that sin be atoned for. This is the entire book of Leviticus. I joked with with John a little bit ago that next week I was just going to come read the entire book of Leviticus as my sermon. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that. But the entire book of Leviticus is, is designed on how people are to atone for their sins, how they are to cover their sins, and it all has to do with the shedding of innocent blood. And it, the word atonement simply means satisfaction or reparation made by giving an equivalent for an injury or by doing or suffering that which is received in satisfaction for an offense. Or injury. So you see, you and I, we have a sin nature, and that's the main thing that keeps us separated from God. And because each of us have a sin nature, sin has to be dealt with. Sin has to be covered. Sin has to be atoned for because God is holy, because God is righteous, because God is just. He cannot be in the presence of sin. And the only way that, that sin can be atoned for is by covering it with the shed blood of something innocent. And so... In the Old Testament, that was done by the sacrificing of animals. It becomes institutionalized in the priestly sacrificial system so that sin can be constantly atoned for. This altar that was built was constantly being used. Can you imagine the amount of slaughtering that went on? I mean, just in in our church, we've got 30 or 40 people here today. It would take me all day to sacrifice the animals just for us. And you've got one altar for a million people. The doves, the bulls, the lambs, all of that that were slaughtered for the covering of their sin. And I don't know if you've ever been around a slaughterhouse or if you've ever participated in that type of stuff. The noise is horrendous. And the smell, oh my gosh. Don't even get me started on the smell. But this new nation needed their sins covered so that God could dwell with them. The rebellion of the golden calf, the intercession of Moses, and the gracious forgiveness of God made it possible for God to dwell with his people. In Exodus 33, it would go on to say this, starting in verse 14. After the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses. I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses says, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on, on, on me, on me and your people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on earth. You get how significant the presence of God is? The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you and I know you by 
name. And Moses responded and cried out, Then show me your glorious presence. God provided guidelines, God desires a place to dwell, and God requires that sins be atoned for. So that's the Old Testament story of Exodus very quickly. So what does this mean for you and for me? First of all, it means, and we need to understand, that God desires to live with you. Andrew said today that, that you know, even with our broken hearts, God still loves us. And that's awesome, isn't it? That God desires to live with you. And we see this, that first of all, Jesus is our high priest. And Jesus' blood once and for all atones for our sin. In Hebrews, it talks about without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And then in Hebrews 10, it goes on to explain how Christ is the one that atoned for our sins. So he was the spotless lamb of God. He was the one that died. That's why we don't have sacrifices anymore, because Christ's sacrifice was done once and for all. So with the blood of Jesus on the doorframe of your life, you are forgiven and you're given direct access to the most holy place. Interestingly enough, when Jesus died, do you remember one of the things that happened right after he died? The curtain was torn in two, right? That curtain that separated the most holy from the holy place, from God's presence in mankind, that was torn in two by Jesus' death. You have direct access to God. And because of Christ's sacrifice, you can come boldly to God. You can trust Jesus' blood to forgive your sins, past, present, and future. And if you've never made that decision today, if you've never trusted God to forgive you, I would invite you to do that now. Jesus is our high priest. Second, we see that we are the place where God dwells. We are the new tabernacle. The church is not a building. The church is us, you and me. We are where God dwells. 1 Corinthians 3 says, Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. When you trust Christ, the Spirit of God dwells within you, and you are the temple. That has profound implications for the stewardship of your bodies. That's why we don't drink to drunkenness. We don't do drugs that alter our mind. We don't eat at all-you-can-eat pizza buffets, right? We take care. That's why we exercise. We take care of our bodies. We steward our bodies because we are the place where God dwells. I used to say, well, God loves pizza, so he needs lots of pizza. But we are the place where God dwells. Third, we see that the greatest commandment is our guideline for relationships with God and other people. So these 10 commandments, these are good moral laws, but the reason that God gave them was because the people needed to obey the law to, to earn their righteousness with him. God knew that that wasn't going to be possible, so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place so that by believing in him, we are made right with God. But now we have what we call the great commandments. Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was because the Jewish rabbis of the day they would take the 613 laws, commandments in the Old Testament, and they would argue about priority, which one should be number one and number two. So when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He settled that debate once and for all, and he said this, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important to love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Pretty simple, very hard to do. He goes on to say in John chapter 13 that your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Love God, love other people, and let God be God. 
I do want to say that these Ten Commandments, even the greatest commandment to love God and love other people, it's not a checklist where at the end of the day you can say, I did love God and I loved other people, so I'm a good person. That's not the intent of these commandments. In fact, in Mark chapter 10, it's not in your notes, but in Mark chapter 10, let's actually go there. Mark chapter 10, uh, it's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, second book in the New Testament. I just, I want to show you guys the heart of Christ here when it comes to these commandments. In Mark chapter 10, verse 17, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? What are the, what's, what's my checklist, God? Give me the checklist. Show me what I can do. Verse 18, Jesus asked, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments, and they're the commandments we just looked at. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely, and you must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. He has checked every single box. Is he good enough? No. Jesus says after this, Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. God loves this man. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go, sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. That's not one of the 613 commands in the Old Testament. But Jesus is saying, that's the one thing you lack. Now, does that mean that you and I have to go sell everything that we own, give the money to the poor, and follow Christ? It might mean that for somebody, but that wasn't prescriptive for everybody. What's Jesus doing here? He's getting to the man's heart, right? Because it was a rich man, a wealthy man that came to him. And he's saying, look, you can obey all the rules, but if God's not number one in your heart, that's not it. You're not going to get eternal life. Love God. Love other people. Number four for the so what, now what. We have to be intercessors for our family and other people. Intercessor just simply means that you're a mediator. You get in between two parties that are in conflict with one another. So remember, the people angered God by creating this golden calf. Moses interceded on their behalf. He pled their case and he offered himself in their place. You and I, when we intercede on behalf of other people, we stand between God and them. That's why we pray for prodigal sons and daughters. That's why we pray for your pastor. That's why you pray for your spouse and for your kids. That's why you pray for your kids' teachers. Right? You're interceding on their behalf. But I want to encourage you that it's not all on you. In 1 Timothy 2, it says, For there is one God, one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. And that's the message that God gave to the world at just the right time. And that's the freedom message that we proclaim here. John 8, 36, If the Son sets you free... You are free indeed. So these rules in the Old Testament, are they for us today? Yes and no. They're not required for us to live by in order to prove our righteousness to God. And they're good moral principles and moral guidelines to guide what we do and how we interact. But praise God, we don't have to check off every box to get to heaven especially when the box has made so much harder and impossible by Christ because he is the one that checks every box. He is the one that enables us. His spirit is the one that enables us to live according to the word of God. Amen? Amen. So those are the kind of rules of engagement. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this group of people. Thank you for your heart for them. Uh, Thank you for... Uh, just a time to worship. Thank you for the rules that showed us how we can uh, live a moral life, but thank you for Jesus, that even when we, when we fail, not if, but when we fail, 
we are still able to enter your presence because of him. It's in his holy and precious name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.